All right, good to see you here this evening, and uh, the faithful here on Father's Day evening, and uh, good to see you in church tonight. Take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading to go Hebrews 11, please. Hebrews chapter 11. Just one verse we want to look at this evening, and then we'll turn over when we get to the message and look at a passage in Genesis. But right now we'll use Hebrews 11 and verse number 7 for our verse to read together this evening. And as we usually do, let's stand together and let's read verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 11. And we'll read that in unison. Ready? By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Father, add your blessing to the reading of the scripture here this evening. Father, I pray that you would continue to make our hearts ready to hear the truth from your word this evening. Thank you for the good music tonight and uh, for the wonderful singing that we've enjoyed. Father, I pray your blessing on the special now as it's sung. May you minister to our hearts and may you put our heart in tune with your heart that we'll have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to each of us this evening. And I'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, hold me safe in your arms. Father, keep me free from all harm. I cast my care on you, just like a child would do. Loving, trusting all that you are. Abba, Father, I rest in you. You're always faithful. You're always true. Abba, Father, you are my song. Though clouds are dark, though night is long, I cry to you, Abba, Father. Father, help me lean on you 
storm. Help me when I can see. Your will is but for me. Love me, hold me, sheltered and warm. Father, mold me, make me like new. Guide my footsteps, keep my heart true, so that the world may see your likeness lives in me. Break me, shape me, make me like you. Abba, Father, I rest in you. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we open up your word tonight. I want to thank you again for the Bible and for preserving your word for us that we could hold copies in our hands tonight. And Lord, I pray that we would receive the word of God tonight, not as the words of men or the words of a man, but as it is in truth, the words of God. I pray it would effectually work in those of us who believe here this evening. And we'll find some help and some encouragement from the, this Father who saved his family. Pray we'll glean some truths from his life that will help us and help the fathers, the dads that are in this room this evening. So have your way in our time together here as we look into your word and Holy Spirit be our teacher. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. When you begin to look through the Bible for an example of really great biblical fathers, it's very difficult to find fathers who were great fathers, and certainly there you'll find out there's none who were perfect fathers. When you start out with the very first father in the Bible, it was Adam, and one of his sons turned out to be a murderer. That's how it starts. Abraham was a great father, but he had to kick his firstborn teenage son, Ishmael, that a son that he had, by the way, with a woman who was not his wife, and had to kick her and him out in the wilderness. Aaron, Moses' brother, the guy from the golden calf fame of Exodus 32, his great parenting skills led to the death of his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, as they ministered the priest's office. Isaac made it so obvious he loved one son, Esau, more than he loved his other one, Jacob, and he and his wife both played favorites and caused problems in their home. Jacob followed that same pattern, and he grew up, and though he had 12 sons, he had a favorite. His name was Joseph. Joseph made him a coat of many colors that he didn't make for any of his other boys. Created quite a bit of jealousy among the boys and they ended up selling Joseph into slavery and going back home and telling dad, your favorite son's dead. Samuel was a great prophet. But Samuel never corrected his sons. Wasn't a good father. In fact, one of the reasons Israel wanted a king was they came and said, your sons don't walk in your way. And they don't follow your, your path. They don't have your integrity. They don't have your character. And therefore, we want a king like all the other nations around us. Talk about David. 
David, the great psalmist of Israel and the great king of Israel, and he'd never, he'd never, he never would have received Father of the Year award. David's weakness was taking care of his own children. He had a son named Ammon who raped his half-sister Tamar, and David didn't do anything. So Tamar's brother, Absalom, decides he'll do something about it. And he ends up murdering Amnon to defend his sister's honor. And again, what did David do about that? Nothing. Oh, he exiled Absalom and didn't talk to him for years. And finally, when Absalom came back home, he wanted to talk to David and David still wouldn't see him. And that led to such a hatred in Absalom's heart for his father, he decided to rebel against him and try to take over the kingdom. And that led to much bloodshed and people's lives being taken. David even had to flee Jerusalem for a while. Leave the palace. So when you, when you look through the Bible and you say, I'd like to find an example of just the perfect father, the truth is, you're hard-pressed to find one. But that's not, that's not discouraging. That really ought to be encouraging. Because when I say there's no perfect dads in the Bible, I understand something. There's no perfect dads in the room either. There's no perfect dads in this room either. There's no perfect dads in this room either. This sermon just got longer. Huh? You see, it's interesting. Though these dads that we just mentioned weren't perfect, they were faithful. You say, wait a minute. How, how, does, that, how does that work? Being faithful has nothing to do with being perfect. Being faithful has nothing to do with you never having some flaws or never doing something wrong. Those not-so-perfect dads that we just listed and talked about, did you know every single one of them is listed in Hebrews chapter 11 except for Adam? The great hall of faith of the Bible, where God lists the heroes of the faith. Now, I think to find a good father, and to find the father we're going to look at tonight as in our example, you don't have to go too far into the Bible. Just about six chapters. And so I want you now to go back to Genesis, if you would, and look at chapter 6 of Genesis. Here's where we meet the one we're going to talk about this evening. It's a man that we read when we read Hebrews chapter 11. It's Noah, of course. And in fact, if you put your finger in Genesis 6, I don't know if you still have Hebrews 11. If not, you can just listen. I'm going to read it for you. The Bible says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. There's four words in that verse that ought to capture our attention. The Bible says the saving of his house. Doesn't mean the structure. It means the people who are in it. When the jailer got saved in Philippi, Paul said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And he believed in the Lord. He, he, he believed in so did his house. It doesn't mean his, you know, the, the, the stone and the brick and the, all that believed. The people in it believed. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's everybody involved in the household. And so Noah prepared an ark to the saving of his house. He moved with fear, warned about things that he's never seen before. We talked a bit about that this morning. Warned about raining, warned about flooding. He'd never seen any of that before. 
And yet he moved with fear, fearing God and what God said, and he built an ark. Why did he build the ark? For the saving of his family. The saving of his family. A dad who saves his family. That seems like a pretty good dad. If I ask you tonight, how many of you dads would like to save your family? Everybody put their hand up. Absolutely. I mean, dads, there's, there's not anybody that would say, no, I don't care to save my family. Let me, let me give you some antonyms for, and by the way, an antonym is an opposite, okay, of the word save, okay? The opposites for the word save is means lose, abandon, endanger, harm, hurt, waste, make vulnerable, squander, throw away. Now, how many dads would say, yeah, I'd like to lose, abandon, endanger, harm, hurt, waste, abandon, uh, 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 make vulnerable, squander, and throw away my family? That would be my goal. No, it wouldn't, no one would raise their hand for that. But if you want to save your family, then we can see what did Noah do? What kind of dad, what kind of father was Noah? that he saved his family. Quite admirable. Quite, uh, quite a blessing that he would be willing to save his family. And we pick that story up in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis 6, the wickedness of man is great in the earth. And if you start reading, if, if we'll pick it up in verse number 5 where God tells us that the God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Now, I want you to understand something before we get into the... I'm going to give you five characteristics of Noah that made him the father that saved his family that I think every one of us could emulate in our life. But I do want, to, want you to understand something, the importance of the father in the home. One of the breakdowns in our society is a breakdown of the home. One of the problems we have with our lawlessness and our selfishness and our weakness uh, among people in our society is the fact that dad is not being dad in the home the way he ought to be. Let me, let me give you some statistics. 90% of homeless and runaway children, these are all, what do all these have in common? I'll tell you at the end. 90% of homeless and runaway children, 63% of the youth who commit suicide, 80% of all rapists, 85% of children with behavioral problems, 71% of all high school dropouts, 75% of all teens in chemical abuse centers, 85% of all youth in prison, and 70% of all girls who become pregnant as teenagers. They all have this in common. They come from homes that do not have a father. I appreciate single parents. I appreciate particularly single mothers that have to do the job of both mom and dad in the home. But it doesn't diminish the importance of a father. And uh, what, what are the characteristics? Listen, not just a man in the home, but a father in the home. What are the characteristics that Noah had that you and I can learn from and, and it could lead to the saving of our family. 
I tell you, Noah, Noah watched the world perish, but there had to be great comfort in his heart to look around and see his three sons and their wives, his family, safe inside the ark with him. Don't you think it would have been a little bit empty even if he had people from the outside who believed and got in the ark and as the waters rose and he heard the cries and he heard the, the screams and he knew that out there screaming were his sons and their wives? I'm not sure he had a great comfort in those who did get in the ark if his family was outside the ark. I think he was very pleased he got his family saved. Amen? Well, let's look at these five characteristics quickly and we'll get you on your way this evening. Dads who save their families. Number one, first characteristics, availability. Availability. God used Noah because he was available. God looked at this entire population and it says in verse 5 that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In fact, it repented the Lord that He made man and it grieved Him in His heart. Scholars say there's the population here of the earth was quite possibly right around a million people. And as God's looking, there's no one that He finds that is seeking Him and that, that is available to Him to use to, to, to save their family. Just Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You understand, if a man's not around to save his family, he can't save his family. You have to be available. God, you know, God doesn't need superstars. He, he, just, he just needs ordinary people who will say, God, here I am. I'm available. Use me. Use me. We've been studying the disciples on Wednesday night. That's who those men were. Just, just ordinary, regular guys, so to speak. But they were available. In fact, later on, the Pharisees and those who were learned would look at those twelve disciples and say, these are foolish and these are unlearned and ignorant men. And yet they took knowledge that they'd been with Jesus. And they turned the world upside down by, by, by others' observation, not their own. They were just men who said, I'll follow. When Jesus said, follow me, they followed Him. Peter and John, just ordinary men. Look what He did through them and through the apostles. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward Him. So God went through the earth and He's looking for someone whose heart was towards God. Somebody who'd be available that He could use. And He found Noah. Dad, are you available? You know, Sometimes to be available to our family, to be available to our children, you have to be willing to give up some things. One of the problems we have in our homes is dad's not available to family and dad's not available to children because dad hasn't grown up yet either. Dad's still playing games too. Dad, dad is still involved in things and takes them away from the family instead of brings them closer to the family. I was surprised to read as I was studying this that, that um, when I say the name Cary Grant, who knows, how many of you know who Cary Grant was? Yeah, everybody, everybody 50 and older about knows who Cary Grant was, but uh, he was a big movie star. Sorry, Nikki, you, you look bad. Well, what's he saying? You know, no. Some of you are 25 and older, but um, they, I guess he's a big movie star in the 50s and early 60s, and, you know, he, he quit in 1966 walked away from his career to take care of his daughter, Jennifer. He wanted to be her. He wanted to keep her away from Hollywood and the influence of Hollywood. Sean Considine was an NFL safety. He retired early after the 2012 season in a Super Bowl win with the Baltimore Ravens saying this, two years ago, I spent six months away from my kids and I said I'd never do that again. 
I have no interest at this time in my children's life in being away from my family. I'm just not doing it anymore. I love football as much as anybody and it's been great to me, but I've gone basically two years and my wife and kids are at the point where I need to be around for them. And he left the football to be with his family. In May of 2015, Google's uh, uh, chief financial officer, Patrick Pitchett, walked away from a seven-figure salary to be with his family. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily you have to walk away from a career or walk away from a job, but it may mean turning down a promotion. It may mean turning down a promotion. It would mean you spend time away from your family. My talked about my dad before. And my dad worked for a manufacturing company. And I don't know what year it was that he took a job for them. And he took a job for them that meant traveling. He would cover some of the eastern part of the United States. I remember probably as just an eight-year-old boy, nine-year-old boy, seven, eight, nine, right in there, uh, in the summer we could take a trip with him. He would leave usually, usually every Tuesday morning and come back on Friday evening. Be gone Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday till Friday night. Sometimes if it was a longer way to go, he'd have to leave Monday morning. He'd be gone all week. And he did that. We were growing up and 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 when when my dad looks back, and there were many times, he said, if I had one regret, he said, I would have never taken that job where I went on the road. I would have stayed home. So I'd been there for my children. He had regrets. Oh, more money? Yeah. Have a have a nicer house? Yeah. But he watched he watched the three older children above me all turn away from God. Not live for the Lord. And that was his great regret. You see, Dad, be available. Be available means you're going to be there and you're going to be around for your family. Intentionally spending time with your kids. Maybe sacrificing some of your personal time or your hobby time to make sure you're available. I was reading, I was reading this week and a little boy, I don't remember how old it says he was, but he, his daddy came home from work and he asked his daddy, how much do you make? How much money do you make, Dad? He said, "Son, that's none of your business. You don't have to concern yourself with that." He goes, "Well, what do they pay you an hour?" And and Dad says, "Son, what's that matter?" He says, "No, I want to know. Tell me, how much money would you make an hour? Would you would you make ten dollars an hour? No, I make more money than that, son. Well, would you make twenty dollars an hour? And just to satisfy his son, he said, "Yes, twenty dollars an hour. That'd be fine." And then he looked at him. He said, "Well, Dad." Can I borrow $10? And he's just a little shaver. And his dad kind of got upset with him and said, no, what are you doing? You just did, you said all that to see if you get money out of me? And he sent him to his room. He said, and time went by and he got to feeling bad that he was maybe, maybe took the frustrations of the day out on his little kid. Just curious. And he went to his bedroom and he said, son, I want to apologize. He said, I was probably a short with you. And you asked me about money and everything, and I probably took my frustration out on you. And I want you to forgive me. And he pulled out $10, and he said, I'll, I'll give you that $10 that you wanted. And that's when the little boy lifted up his pillow, and there was money under his pillow. And then the dad got mad again. What are you asking money for me for when you have money? You don't need more money when you already have money under your pillow. And he, and he sees the little boy gathering the money up and he said, no, no, Dad, no, I got enough. He says, what do you mean you have enough? He said, you said you make $20 an hour. Dad, I got $20. Can I buy an hour of your time? Can I buy an hour of your time? Are you available for your children to spend time with them and to invest in your family? Noah was available. Number two, Noah was aware of the danger. Noah was aware of the danger. 
The first danger, there are two dangers he had to be aware of. Number one, he was living in a very sinful and evil world. A very sinful and evil world. We read verse 5, how the every imagination of the thoughts of the heart of man was only evil continually. You drop down verse number 11. The Bible says the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted His way upon the earth. I mean, it was a messed up place. I know that we don't know that we don't know the half of what shape this world's in. And I don't want to know. What I know is bad enough. I don't want to know anymore. But it, it isn't yet to the level that this was. Where God destroyed it with the flood. But I know this, if I'm going to save my family, men, if we're going to save our families, we better recognize the dangers of an evil and a wicked world in which we live. It's all around us. And the devil, the prince of the power of the air, the prince of the power of this world, he is after our children and after our families. And dads, you better be aware of the danger. According to the website, Covenant Eyes, they list the greatest dangers the internet possesses to our children. Job said this in Job 31 verse 1, I've made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Here's the top four internet dangers. Number one, pornography. Repeatedly viewing pornography, especially from a young age, will radically shape one's sexual attitudes and beliefs. It'll grow a cynicism for true affection and through proper relationships between husbands and wives. In fact, it's interesting. Even one Major League Baseball team now, the Kansas City Royals, has started a, a help, a, I'm not sure what they called it, it wasn't therapy, but it was a class to help the players on their team who are addicted to pornography. This isn't a Christian, this isn't a Christian baseball team, okay? This is a Major League Baseball team. But even lost people are understanding the detrimental effect that that's having on their players. And it's affecting their, their, their whole life. Before the age of 18, are you listening? 83% of boys and 57% of girls have seen sexual acts online. Mom and Dad, you better be careful when you hand your kid a cell phone with internet capabilities. You better be careful. The second danger, according to Covenant Eyes, is this thing called sexting. Where you send or receive partially nude photos or nude photos through the internet or cell phones. Those images are easily forwarded on to others. And those images can be considered, they can be considered child pornography. And when you receive, if you receive one on your phone and you don't immediately delete it, you are a felon. If they find that on your phone, you will be charged with felony. And you will go to prison. One man received something from a teenager, took it home and showed his wife. They went to confront the parents of the, the boy who sent it. Those parents called the police. The police came and arrested the man for receiving the image and not deleting it immediately. Twenty percent of teens, one out of every five, said they have sent or posted a nude or semi-nude image of themselves. The third danger is cyberbullying. Bullying happens in our world. It happened on the playground or at school. Now it's extended to the digital world. Social media. 
Hurtful words are exchanged. Rumors start very easily and spread quickly. Profiles get hacked. One in five teenagers say someone's written something about them online that is not true. 10% say someone's threatened to use electronic communication, social media, to tell others private things about them as a form of blackmail. The fourth danger the covenant eye says that you face is predators. There's predators out there that will befriend your child and pretend to be their friend. Internet predators are expert manipulators. They'll foster a relationship with the child or with the teenager. They'll prey on the teen's desire to be liked, to be accepted, to have friends. They groom that child through flattery and sympathy, investing time in their online relationship. And it can turn into kidnapping and abduction very easily. 76% of predators are 26 years of age or older. 47% of offenders are 20 years older than their victims. 83% of the victims who met their offender face to face willingly went somewhere with them. They had earned their trust. All I'm saying is, dads, you better be aware of the danger. I, I thank God every day, Brother Tom, that I reared my kids before all this stuff came out. I'm glad I grew up before all this stuff came out. Parents, you have a, you have a difficult, difficult job. Those of you with teens and preteens and younger who are going to grow up in this this age of technology. you got to be on your game, Dad. you got to be aware of the dangers that are out there. That the world presses against our kids. There's an enemy. And he wants to, to steal and to kill and to destroy. And he'd like nothing better than to get a hold of our children when they're young so he can have them for the rest of their life. Be aware. He lies to the kids. He lies to our children about what real beauty is. What success is. And if they're not careful, they'll succumb to his lies. They feel like they don't measure up or they're not good enough. So be careful. The second danger is the danger of living in a way that's against God. Look down in your Bible in chapter 6 of verse 13. God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, and the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in it, or in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And he gives the instructions there. And then verse 17, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee, and they shall be male and female. There's a real danger if you live in a way that's against God and rejects God. Let me read a passage to you from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 when the Bible says, And you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just as sure as God said, uh, because they're wicked, because they're violent, because they don't regard me, because they don't live after my ways, I will destroy the earth 
God one day will come and He'll come in flaming fire to take vengeance on those who will not live God's way and will not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And He will be absolutely just to do so. Oh, God's so loving. He wouldn't send anybody to hell. He is absolutely loving, but He is absolutely just. And justice says that we are guilty before God And listen, if I don't receive Christ as my Savior, if I don't accept what God has done for me, I deserve to be punished by Him. I'm choosing to be punished by Him. And in justice, He deserves to do that, and He will do that, and He is absolutely right to do that. Mom and Dad, it doesn't do your son or daughter any good if they gain the whole world but lose their own soul. most important thing to be concerned about your children is not whether they can excel at sports or whether they can get good grades at school or whether they're the most popular or the prettiest or the nicest looking or most well accepted or what career field they're in or what college they'll get accepted to. The greatest concern you have is for them to develop a heart for God and develop a walk with with God. You desire that they know Him and and want to please Him with their life. So dads who say their family are available. Number two, they're aware of the dangers. Number three, they're willing to be different. Dad, you have to be willing to be different. Noah was a just man, verse 9, and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. He dared to be different. Remember, how many other people were doing that? Huh, nobody. Not not a. He didn't even have a church to go to. He didn't have anybody else that encouraged him except for his own family. But he wasn't afraid to stand out. He wasn't afraid to be different. He wasn't afraid to stand alone. He wasn't afraid of what other people thought of him. The Bible says, The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Noah didn't buy into everything the world was doing. He didn't buy into their philosophy. He didn't buy into their way of living. He didn't just come to, well, everybody's doing it. Well, that's just the way it is. That's just the day and age in which we live. He didn't buy into that. He dared to be different. And man, if you're going to save your family, you have to be willing to be different. And I know I'm preaching to the choir a little bit tonight because you're in church on Father's Day Sunday night. <laughs> and that's different. Sadly, to say, sad to say that's even different in, in Christianity these days. I was getting a haircut earlier this week and the barber goes to a, a, a Free Will Baptist church here in the Columbus area and was just talking to me about how they'll, they'll have church this Sunday, but just Sunday morning. Not Sunday night because, you know, people want to go spend time with their family. What's wrong with spending time with your family on Saturday? What's wrong with spending time with your family Sunday afternoon? Why why do you have to forfeit gathering together with God's people to spend time with your family? I, I didn't understand that. And at the same breath, I'm silent. I don't say anything. And he, and he says, well, he says, of course, I... I think we ought to just go ahead and have church for whoever's there. I said, well, I agree with that. I think you ought to just have church. And whoever can come will come. And those who are out of town or somewhere else, they won't come. But you ought to have church. Listen, listen. You're going to, churches now, they, 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 give up, they, they give up Mother's Day night, Father's Day night. They'll give up July 4th night. They'll give up Memorial Day night. They'll give up Labor Day Sunday night. Pretty soon, about every other month, you're having a Sunday night off and not having church. And you know what people will do? They'll say, well, it must not be too important. I guess, I guess we'll find something else to do on Sunday night too. It's not that important. You see, you've got to be willing to be different. You have to be willing to... You're not going to be able to live like the world and save your family. It won't work. The kids need to see that we speak and we act, and we live, and we value, and we care, and we respond, and we love differently than the world does. 
that it's not the same. Is there a difference in your home? If somebody came and spent some time where you live, would they be able to say, this is a Christian home? Are there something different going on here? Or would they say, yes, yeah, just like our house? I mean, I, I know our world's a mess. I'm thankful that this past week the Supreme Court ruled that that, that a bakery doesn't have to bake a cake for someone who's going to have a wedding between two, two men or two women. Don't have to participate in that. I'm glad about that. I remember several years ago when that... Uh, wasn't it a two-year-old or something fell into the gorilla cage? You remember that? And they had to shoot the gorilla, and everybody got mad. They had to kill the gorilla to save a two-year-old baby. I'm sorry about the gorilla, but that's a human life. But you understand why people get upset? Because we kill 2,700 human lives every day. And don't bat an eye. called abortion. I know, we're in a, we're in a mixed up and wildly out of control world. And Christians, listen, as the world gets worse and worse and further from God and further from God, and we desire to be closer to God and closer to God and to walk with God, there's going to be a bigger difference. But sadly, in many, many Christian churches, you're not seeing more of a difference, you're seeing less of a difference. We ought to be willing to be different. Dads who say the family are available. They're aware of the danger. They're willing to be different. Number four, they walk with God. That's what it said in verse number nine, the very last phrase, Noah walked with God. Did you know walking with God is not something you do by accident? It's not something that's just going to happen. The chances of you just waking up one morning and being spiritually mature and, and, and uh, being close to God and you just wake up that way one morning is about the same odds as the Cleveland Browns winning the Super Bowl. It's never going to happen. Alright? It doesn't work that way. But God desires we walk with Him. Remember Adam and Eve? God would come down in the cool of the day and what would He do? Walk with them. Fellowship with them. That's what God made them for. He made them to fellowship with Him. And that's why the boundaries were set up. I set up these boundaries so you can fellowship with me. <coughs> that had to be pretty sweet. But then the deception came. The disobedience came. What's called the fall of man came the disobedience to God, the sin. And what was once a normal part of life, something that they enjoyed and looked forward to every day, was something that now would become struggle. Not normal, unnatural, and rare. What are we saying? Dads, if you're going to develop a walk with God, you're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to pursue it. You're going to have to want it. And I mean really want it. Go after it with all you got. Pursue it with a passion. You know, when we really want to do something, we can go after it, fellas. And when you really want to go after pursuing God and having a relationship with Him and getting to know Him and getting to know His Word and establishing a walk with Him, you can do it if you want to do it bad enough. And I'll say this, if you don't, you can always find an excuse. As we take our relationship with God seriously, you'll find that not only will you enjoy the relationship with God, but you're going to find you'll receive what you need to be the father and the husband that you need to be. God will give you what you need. He, he'll empower you to be what you should be. You see, so often when there's problems at home, and whether it's between a dad and his, 
and his children or a, or a husband and his wife, we want to work on these areas. And the truth is, if we just get this one straightened out, these will straighten out. We can spend all our time trying to get this right, but if this isn't right, these are never going to be right. Get your walk with God. That's why in Ephesians 5, when it talks about the husband and the wife, and later on in chapter 6, the parents and the children, it all starts up in chapter 5 when it says, be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. None of those things, you're not going to be able to do any of those things in Ephesians 5 and 6 if you're not filled with the Spirit. It's all going to fall apart. Walk with God. Noah is willing to walk with God. Well, we have four of them so far. He's available. He's aware of the dangers. He's willing to be different. He's walking with God. And then last number five, a man who's going to save his family will never quit. Never quit. Interesting verse in verse number three of Genesis 6. Notice that with me, William. We'll, we'll be wrapping it up. Ready? And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. God is saying here there's a limit to what he'll put up with, with mankind. My spirit will not always strive with man. God is saying there's a, there's a clock ticking that on, on how long he'll take, how long he'll have patience with this human race. They went past it. God made the decision to destroy the world. But he said, I'm going to destroy the world, but I'm giving you 120 years until I'll destroy it. Now think about that. Can you, can you imagine? Could you maintain your enthusiasm and your energy for something God wants you to do if it took 120 years to do it? If it took your whole life to do it? Could you keep your motivation up? I wonder if there's some days Noah looked up at the ark and said, I don't think I want to work on this thing anymore. I don't think I want to pound any more nails. You know, he didn't have, a, he didn't have the nail gun. <laughs> day in, day out. Nailing. Building. Sawing. Whatever. I wonder if you ever thought, you know, I put my 40 years in. Can I just get a gold watch and retire? <laughs> Lord, this is taking a long time. Think about that. You know what's great? Noah never gave up. Noah never quit. Noah, a man of commitment. And the Bible says that Noah was preaching a sermon. The New Testament tells us he was a preacher of righteousness. Oh, he wasn't in church standing behind a pulpit, but he preached a sermon every day. He was out working on that ark. He and his boys. He preached a sermon to a world that was watching, mocking him, making fun of him. Every time he pounded a nail in, or every time he bent a board into shape, or he the, sawed the board off. Every time he did that, he was telling everyone watching, I believe God. I believe God's going to do exactly what He said He's going to do. You mock all you want. You make fun of me all you want. But I'll just believe God. Dads who save their families don't give up. I've seen so many times where families do well and they hold the line and then the children get to be 16 and 17 and, 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 and then all of a sudden, man, they, they let everything go. 
Mom and dad all of a sudden don't have any rules and don't have any standards anymore. You say, man, what happened? You know what they say? I'm just tired of it. Tired of fighting. Tired of arguing. I give up. You can't give up. You never, ever, ever give up. You have to stay in the fight. I think it was Mark Twain who said that when a when a child turns 13, you, you put them in a box and you cut a little hole in it so they can breathe. And you leave them in there. He said, now when they turn 17, plug up the hole. All right? now, I'm not advising that. But those of you who have had 17-year-olds, you probably understand what that's about. So you understand, you cannot give up. There'll be problems, there'll be pressures, there'll be people who make you want to just, just throw in the towel. But God uses people who refuse to give up. Who'll just stay at it. Knocked down, but not knocked out. A just man falleth seven times, but rises up again. You just don't stay down. You don't. You may get discouraged, but you don't stay discouraged. Emmett Smith is the all-time leading rusher in the NFL with over 18,000 yards. That's a little over 10 miles. But he got knocked down 4,370 times. Well, how did he get all those yards? Because he got back up. Okay, you get knocked down. Okay, you have a setback. All right, you, you, you fall. Get back up. And keep on going for God. Be ye therefore steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is never in vain in the Lord. Things you never hear a dad say who's going to save his family and who walks with God, you'll never hear him say, I give up. I quit. Noah was available. Noah was aware of the dangers. Noah was willing to be different. Noah walked with God and Noah never quit. He never gave up. Dads, if you follow that example, you can save your family. I pray God will help us to be like Noah. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth here this evening. Thank you for Noah. Thank you for his life. Lord, we relate. We feel like we're in such a wicked age right now. It sure seems like the imagination of man's heart is only evil continually. There's so much wickedness now with the different ways that sin and wickedness and violence and immorality can come into our lives. God, I pray You'd give us some fathers that'll say, God, use me to save my family as Noah saved his family. I pray we'd have some dads here that would say, I'm going to be available to my family. I'm going to be there for them. I'm going to be around for them to talk to and to pray with them and to encourage them and to teach them and to instruct them. Dads will be very aware of the dangers that could come into their home, into their children's lives. Dads who will make it their passion to walk with God, be willing to be different than the world, and to draw close to you and draw nigh to you. Men that will say, I'm never giving up. I'm going to keep on keeping on for God. I'll be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of our Lord. Give us those kind of fathers at Bible Baptist Church.